Hello, my name is Kristen Baxter, and I'm an Associate Professor of Art in the Art Department at Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I've put together a sequence of videos online for my students to view on their own as we are learning about the artistic development of children and adolescents. So this first video then is simply an overview of what to expect coming up um, during these next series of videos. So I'd like to just give you an overview of what to expect. So each of the eight videos that I have posted are about 15 to 20 minutes long each. And I combine both videos and then questions that I pose to you as a class that you can then use our discussion board on Canvas to respond to those questions and then to respond to each other as well. So each of the videos focuses on the developmental milestones in children and adolescent lives. So we will look at the physical or what's called the psychomotor development, social or emotional development, academic or cognitive, artistic development, and then we'll look at what does that all mean for art education curriculum design, even for curriculum design in the early childhood education classroom as well. So we'll go through each of those areas of development for each stage of development, which we'll talk about here. So the first video that you'll watch next We'll look at the developmental milestones of children in infancy through preschool. So the first video will just look at physical or psychomotor development and then social emotional development. So each video will be relatively short so that the information is more manageable. The second video will still keep looking at infancy through pre-K but here we'll focus on what are the academic developmental milestones for very young children and then how is their artistic practices changing as they grow and we'll look again how does that those things imp impact how we teach how we plan lessons video three will look at the same developmental milestones again, but now we'll look at the early elementary age children. Video four, again, still looking at elementary school ages, ages five to nine, but again, academic artistic development, and then how does all of this developmental knowledge impact how we create curriculum? Video five will focus on the middle school years, so ages 10 to 13. Again, starting with physical and social development. Video six will focus on, just like the others, you can see my pattern here, will focus on academic and artistic development, how it impacts art education curriculum design. And then finally, we'll end with looking at developmental milestones for high school kids, including their artistic development. So the goal for this first video um, is that after viewing it, if you wouldn't mind sharing your responses to this question then on the discussion board on Canvas. And I will set up a discussion board assignment so you'll be able to see exactly where to post this. But as you listen to the next few minutes of this video, think about your own vivid experiences, either teaching art in pre-K to grade 12, some of you have already done some field experiences, or if not, uh, just in general, what are your early memories of art making as a child in your own life? So again, just to give a broad overview of kind of the themes or the issues that we will look at throughout all of the videos, 
I wanted to just show you some artwork that's been made by some of my very young students. So this painting was created by a preschooler who took my art class at, which I teach at the Banana Factory, which is on the south side of Bethlehem. This was a class for two to four-year-old children and their caregivers. And you can see this painting then, very, very expressive. Uh, you can tell on the left-hand side of that painting that the child was using actually a yogurt cup and stamping with it to create those circles. The lines, the parallel lines across the top of the page, those were actually created by a matchbox car that they were rolling through the paint. Also, you can see scratched lines across that big red mark in the middle of the painting. Um, th that was created using a fork. So really expressive. Here's another one. Um, I also gave the students, um, I went to the dollar store and bought uh, like a duster that you would use to dust the house, um, various types of sponges and scrubbies that you might use in the kitchen. Uh, so you can see that they use these things, especially along the bottom edge and on the left bottom left corner. Uh, you can see those prints that they're making. Um, so really expressive, really mixing colors, mixing marks throughout the page. Here too, I had cut up uh, sponges into small shapes. So this uh, child used those sponges then on the upper left corner. You can see, see those kind of uh, prints from the sponges. But look at how you can see that swirling motion. We're gonna be really looking carefully at little children's art making and how um, you can tell they're using their whole arm to create this painting. It's not just a small work where they're using a paintbrush very carefully. It's, it's very expressive, very sensory. This child used um, a potato masher, you can see on the right side, uh, to create those prints. Here too, you can see um, on the left, the use of um, a fork to create some lines. Um, also in this uh, two to four year old class, we also did some collage work. So this was just simple cut paper shapes that we had. The kids could create uh, various collages. So you can see, you know, that the students are, the children are really creating artwork using their senses, their sense of sight to change the colors, their sense of touch, physically touching the paint or the glue or the paper to cut and rip and glue. Um, so in the very young ages, kids are very much uh, they're very much motivated by that sensory experience. But what we will look at throughout these videos is how that's not often what's done in schools or um, in pre-K facilities or even with parents, uh, really. So you often see things like this, right? Penguins, lots of penguins. My students and I often laugh about um, these sorts of bulletin boards in schools where every penguin uh, looks exactly the same. Pinterest has a ton of uh, a ton of activities for creating penguin art. Uh, so it's it's all over. <laughs> um, again, may be cute, they may be fun to make with kids, um, but if we compare those types of make and take projects to what little children are actually interested in doing, it's very different. 
even with 3D pieces, again, this was in my two to four year old class at the Banana Factory. Here we used a material called Model Magic. Um, it is a self-hardening type of clay material. It almost feels like a foam. So that's what's on the paper plate here. And then they've used uh, pipe cleaners, some shells, uh, little plastic and glass uh, gems that you might use maybe in mosaics, um, and also popsicle sticks to create these forms, let's say. <laughs> so again, pre-K, they're really interested in uh, exploring materials and how they can shape those materials and make them do different things. Um, but on the other hand, what you see often online, and I love Pinterest, and I love these types of crafts, but they're not art. <laughs> so much of our videos are going to really kind of, I'd love to have a discussion with you virtually online uh, about when crafts like this might be appropriate, when they might not be. I think of these as kind of the tip of the iceberg. Yes, they can be fun um, and you can do them easily with all different ages without much instruction, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg when we think of what's possible with art making with children. And I just show you another example. I teach in, in an after school art program at Central Elementary School in Allentown. And this was a little sculpture done by a kindergartner. And he used metallic watercolor paints on that same model magic material. And then those are cut straws in this. So really just interested in swirling colors, in seeing what happens when you mix them and you roll it up into a ball, pushing these little uh, straws into the form, very sensory. But again, how does that compare with what we often see in schools? Maybe we've made stuff like this when we were in schools. Um, throughout our time together too, we are going to really focus on materials. So our paper plates, really the best art material. Again, what are the benefits and limitations of paper plates? Or in the case of this monkey here, much of that has to be pre-cut by the teacher. Um, little kids can't cut things that precisely. So we'll, we'll also be looking at how materials affect how we plan lessons. And for those of you who are interested in going deeper into that, I teach a course called Processes and Structures that's a 100 level art class, and that's a whole semester where we dig really deeply into wet mediums, dry mediums, printmaking, fibers, bookmaking, photography. We, we look at materials really closely and we uh, see what kind of processes are best suited for certain ideas or for certain lessons. Um, but for these videos, we will touch on that a little bit. We'll look at how materials affect the art lesson. For instance, food. Using food is a big thing uh, in schools, in, in families, perhaps making, uh, making art projects at home. You might have seen this ubiquitous pan turkey project. Um, Lots of problems that I would love for us to discuss online together. Uh, what are some problems with using food in schools or even at home if we're parents working with our own children? We see a lot of projects online. Again, lessons that come with uh, food. Here was one that was actually on the Scholastic website, which is a giant, you know, publication, publishing company for schools. Uh, this was a landforms lesson, and you can see I put what in big letters. 
it said that the subject that this supported was art and creativity. So here the lesson is using bread and cutting or maybe eating part of the bread and then gluing the bread onto paper to learn about landforms. This is not art or creativity. <laughs> uh, so we can have a nice discussion about that online too, about what are some problems with using food in lessons. There's options to dye pasta using Kool-Aid, to use those pieces of pasta on puppets. This was a screenshot from Lakeshore Learning. This is, again, a huge company that supplies furniture and all kinds of educational materials to schools. If you are in early childhood, you might have already looked at the Lakeshore website for materials. But look closely at this puppet is covered in pasta. <laughs> um, you know, what is the problem with using food? These are this is an activity where kids were using vegetables to do printmaking. Um, this was a lesson on a website called Teach Preschool. And it's called the lesson was called Exploring Texture Through Sensory Play. I love that theme for pre-K, but this is dyed pasta. And when I have a real classroom filled with all of you right in front of me, we have a nice discussion often about kind of the ethical implications of using food as an art material, or in this case here, just as a sensory exploration activity. Um, many of our children in Bethlehem area schools and Allentown uh, are, food, are in families who are food insecure. So what message does this send when we are using food in this way? Um, there's issues with allergies, you know, bugs or rodents. Uh, so thinking about materials and what we allow into our art lessons is another aspect of art and child development. Another kind of point that we will talk about is the use of art history. That's something else that comes up so frequently in the study of art education and child development. We often see lessons where kids learn about artists like this, Van Gogh's Starry Night, and then they create projects like this. Again, we will, as we go through the semester and as I upload these videos for you, and as you reply to our conversations on the discussion board on Blackboard, or I'm sorry, on Canvas, we will look at when is it appropriate to use certainly art history in the classroom but what kind of lessons do we want to teach? Is it just mimicking the work of adult artists? Uh, when is this appropriate? When is it not? When is it more a limiting uh, type of, of activity? So that said, is it ever appropriate, <laughs> even necessary to plan these types of activities that I mentioned? So if so, when? Uh, and add your ideas to the discussion board on Canvas. So throughout these videos, what we I had listed some questions here that you can look forward to for upcoming videos, such as what are the benefits and the limitations to the types of projects we just looked at, including the very open-ended sensory ones that I've done at the Banana Factory and at Central Elementary School, how can we plan projects that both support and challenge children's and adolescents' development? How can we implement constructivist and choice-based teaching strategies into art ed curriculum design? Those of you who are doing the art ed certification or early childhood no doubt have learned about constructivism and choice-based teaching strategies in your other education courses, but we will be introduced to those theories too. How do we implement the theory into practical terms in our lessons? 
How can we plan best practices at the very beginning of lesson planning so that we meet the needs of all learners, including English language learners and students with disabilities? How can teachers and parents critically evaluate the many options for art lessons? So as a professional, you will have so many options available to you through Pinterest, through other teachers, through your school district's curriculum. How do you make sense of what's a good lesson and what does not really have many meaningful learning objectives? What are the limitations and criticisms of studying artistic development and children, of children and adolescents? What do other researchers and teachers say? What are their points of view? So like every other theory, the theories revolving around artistic development have lots and lots of critics. <laughs> so we will also look at those points of view. So I think we can learn a lot from artistic development of children and, and theories associated with that. But I also think it's great to look at what the problems are with those theories as well. So finally, then just to go back to the beginning, the goal for this one video is just to, to, sh just to share some of your ideas about the questions we talked about and then specifically what are your most vivid experiences either teaching art in your field placements or your own early art making experiences when you were a child. And if any of the ideas that I just introduced here kind of resonate with you. Uh, so I will put a discussion board assignment on Canvas and we can continue the conversation then. And in the coming days, I'll just keep adding to this whole repertoire of videos. There should be then eight in the sequence as I described earlier. So thank you so much and I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.